Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode 11. And with myself Ryan, we got Sam and we got Jackson. Hey. Today we're going to be covering a little bit of industry news, letting you guys know what's going on in the world of film. Um, then Sam actually had the pleasure of um, doing an interview with a tie from my indie productions. So we'll get into that. And um, finally, we're going to be doing a, a little bit of a news segment where we're going to discuss the horror genre um, once a month. And specifically today, we're going to be discussing serial killers. So without further ado, Sam, do you want to hit us up with some industry? On Monday the 6th of April, Quibi is launching. Now Quibi is a new VOD site, although not necessarily just film, it's also TV. It could potentially change the game. It could. Or it could be just another diversion of a billionaire. Quibi yeah. has been launched by Jeff Katzenberg. Ke Jeff Katzenberg <coughs> was the former head of DreamWorks, which is a studio that he uh, co-run with uh, Spielberg. And essentially, there are seven minute content. So each thing has been split. And so if you've got like a whole feature that's 140 minutes, it'll be brought into you weekly in seven minute segments. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. I think when, when we first heard about this, I was kind of like, I thought this was a crap idea. I thought this, was, <laughs> this wasn't going to be very good at all. Because like a seven, seven minute content from sort of even from like high-end directors you kind of go well, what what are they really going to do with seven minutes i'd rather see them you know focus on a film but but now things have changed in terms of the way that people want to uh, take in content and, and not leave the home so this as a streaming service might it may do very well and they've got some good talent behind it we've got um well uh, i can never say his name right guillermo de toro he's doing a show uh, Spielberg's doing a horror show that only could be watched after dark. Again, I don't know how that's going to work, but we'll see. Is that dark in America? or? Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Dark over here. <laughs> uh, Anton Fuqua, he's, he's done a um, feature film which he's kind of split as a TV series. And Sam Rami has got a horror TV show. Oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah, it's like different horrors in different states of America. So it is an interesting idea, and I did read that essentially, for some of them, they can, after three years, decide to re-edit the footage and put it into a feature format. Which I suppose, in a sense of you, you know, wanting to make sure you've got a lot of material out there, could be beneficial. We'll see. It's, it's, a, it's a new thing. It might be good. It kind of sounds like it's almost like the filmmakers are piloting their own content in a small dose. That they could go back and re-edit it and sort of tidy it up to make it a feature. That's it. It it's could potentially go like that. It's where it's very early days. It, it to me it depends on the content as well. This mm. might just not be as as compelling to watch every seven minutes. You might just be like, this is just boring. So we'll see. Really, as the world uh, starts to change and go into new directions, the industry has obviously had to do a massive reschedule. So Quiet Place has now been pushed into September. More towards uh, Labor Day in America, which is usually like early September. And Candyman has now been pushed into September, which means you're basically going to get this horror onslaught where you get, I don't think it's all going to come out, but if it does, you'll get Candyman, A Quiet Place, Conjuring Free, and in October you'll get Halloween. So we'll see if they all stick around because it does not feel like they will. And then like, Every time I tried to write new information about what was going to be on the schedule, all the studios just kept announcing. So if I say any, there's probably more that would be moved by the time I finish speaking. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Sony pushed all their summer releases to March 2021. Disney have pushed all their releases into random different points. Wes Anderson's new film, The Great Dispatch, has been moved to October. It was in a prime sort of June release. So, so it's probably still going to be screened at Cannes, however they decide to do that. And one film that I feel kind of weird that's not been moved yet I know is what you're say. Christopher Nolan's yeah. new film. Uh, I was, July, isn't it? Yeah, and obviously Nolan has always been the great champion of cinema. He literally lobbied to try and get like money to make sure the cinemas can survive. So I understand why they've not said to him, it's not coming out in cinema anytime soon. But then in the end of July, we'll see. You know, it's we may be in that position. Probably more so in the UK. I think with like Christopher Nolan, very briefly, he loves that July spot. He does. It's pretty much been every release apart from Interstellar, in recent years at least. Yeah, yeah. 
On a more independent side, our good friend Tom Lee Rutter has released a trailer for his latest film. His latest film is called Pocket Full of Superstition. You can check it out on his Carney Features YouTube channel. We'll put the link down below. We've seen bits of this film. We've had little sneaky bits when he came down for when, he, when we shot uh, right here, right now. And it's, it was looking really cool. It's like a selection of short films, very much set in that sort of um, 20s, 30s kind of style. And I, I, the guy always brings such an interesting aesthetic to anything he does. And speaking of uh, previous work of Tom, his film Day of the Stranger is going to be out on pre-release from Darkseid releasing this month, which will also be alongside our very own The Millennial Killer, which is, yes, going to have a limited release this month through Darkseid releasing. We will obviously be talking more about that over the next few weeks and how you can get a copy of that film. And keep an eye out because we'll be uh, putting out a new trailer of that soon as well. Yes. Thanks, Sam. And... Um... Yeah, like I said before in the intro, um, Sam actually had the pleasure the other day of uh, interviewing Atai, who is the creator and owner of My Indie Productions, based out in Australia. Um, great guy, he's done a lot of different reviews and stuff for a lot of our content. Um, so yeah, Sam, do you want to... Yeah, he was, he was a really interesting guy, I learned a lot from him. And yeah, because of the time differences, it was, you know, so yeah. Let's listen to my interview. So I got a chance to interview Itai from My Indie Productions. How you doing, man? You good? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing good. Um, we're on completely different times. I believe you're just waking up and I'm in my dressing gown ready to go to bed. So that's interesting. Yeah. Aust Australia's in the future. Yeah. <laughs> you're speaking to the future right now. How did you get into uh, indie filmmaking? Um, I've, I've always been a fan of film, um, you know, like from when I was a young kid. Um, basically just watched them non-stop. Uh, knew all the actors, all that sort of stuff. But um, I always kept it as, as a hobby. Never really tried to, you know, make films or even write scripts, even though I was kind of writing them in my head all the time. Um, and in about uh, 2004, 2005, um, a friend of mine, Peter Angel, and I were just kind of talking and thought, no, why not try to make a, a short film, write a script, um, you know, kind of advertise online, get some people uh, who are more sort of uh, in the technical fields to help us out and, and go from there. And yeah, we wrote a script and uh, we roped in a few friends and uh, a couple of people who were more uh, in the field. And um, yeah, and did that and it was actually quite successful. And um, we, we tried to make a feature, but it was just too, too costly at the time for us. So we put that away and then put the whole thing away for a little while. Um, and then in... 2009, I moved from Australia to Israel just for a bit of a change, and then when I was there, I decided to go to film school. Just rolled on from there. Oh, nice. And um, yeah, because obviously people know you from My Indie Productions, which is a website that facil facilitates uh, independent art, but you are a filmmaker in your own right at the same time. <coughs> Sorry about that. Well, My Indie, my indie, my indie Productions was. was sort of first and foremost a production company um, of course yes films. Uh, yeah uh, we made a couple of films before um, before the website you know before we put up the website basically launched it or whatever but once we did um, I was more in in the community, you know, in the indie filmmaking community online, and I could see that the problems we were having with exposure, um, with any kind of assistance that didn't cost an arm and a leg, was was a problem for all you know indie filmmakers or most indie filmmakers. So we just, I just made the decision to dedicate a section of the website um, to helping other indie filmmakers get some more exposure, get, get an audience, uh, you know, even potentially some revenue for their work. Um, and it just kind of grew from there. And I think today the website is more known for that than it is as a production company. Um, 
um, but a lot of people are confused because of it. And the thing is, it was it was never meant, you know, um, to be that. It just kind of happened. So the name Wendy Productions stayed on it, even though all those films we promote are not actually, uh, you know, our productions. We're just promoting other indie filmmakers. It's such a beautiful thing you do, though. And I remember, like, when you when when you did first start up. And um, I think it was Ron Valderrama that got me in touch with you um, from our work yeah, we were doing the makeup. Yeah, through stream now. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. And it was like really surprising to see because um, you you had Domziano Cristofo in your listing, and then later on you had like Shane Ryan. And there's just so many people that I'd been working with within Trash Arts who I didn't even know were connected to different people, and it made me see how kind of close the UK, uh, not the UK, sorry, the the indie film scene is in general that once you see those names you see that they're all supporting each other and I think your website does so well in promoting that yeah we hope so um, it, it is getting harder and harder to, to keep it going because it's just it's grown so much and um, you know there are lots of costs involved um, and since it's not a, a revenue generating uh, website it's, it's pretty much free promotion uh, we've, we've kind of hit a wall um, with costs and now we're kind of thinking about different ways to possibly um, monetize and if that doesn't work, um, we're probably going to, I don't know, start thinking about alternative ways of doing it but it's just um, just like everything else in the eventually it comes down to the costs um, yeah, yeah. and how you pay for them as you would know very well. Yeah, I wanted to um, I wanted to get back and talk about your short films because um, the first short films you did before approaching with the feature were uh, it was Third Temple and um, Ivy. Is that correct? Well, Third Temple we made in twenty fourteen. Um, it was the first short made under Mindy Productions. Um, the short that I made in two thousand and five was under a different production company that didn't last long because it was never meant to. It's called uh, Vagrant Productions. Um, but uh, with my indie, yeah, we made um, the Temple and after that we made a uh, web series called The Bruce Springsteens. Um, then we, we, we remastered, re-edited um, a film we made previously called Dolphin. Um, that one went on to a uh, a small um, sort of festival release. It actually did pretty well. It won a couple of awards. Nice. And um, Ivy came after that, but um, but Ivy was it well is part of a bigger film. It's part of the feature that we're um, working on, Revelation. Yes. Do you want do you want to tell us a bit and, more about Re Revelation? Sorry. Sorry. Do you want to tell us a bit more about Revelation? Yeah, yeah Revelation is a is a post-apocalyptic horror drama, I guess. Um, we, I, I wrote it as a, as a sort of four-part um, film. It's, it's divided into four segments because I knew that to shoot a feature sort of of that magnitude, I wouldn't be able to, to handle the cost. And I started thinking about ways to do that. And, uh, and the way I figured out how to do it, it's like, it's not exactly an anthology because all these um segments are connected um but it's shot in that way kind of okay. like four short films that um that work together we've shot two of them ivy is one another one it's a segment called faith um and we have two more to go um and every time we were about to get into we were kind of into pre-production of, of the next one something happened and there was a delay um, well currently it's the coronavirus situation um, so the film that was supposed to be completed in late 2019 has now been sort of moved to 2021. Yeah, I, I, I know that feeling of having to delay things mm. because of the current situation. And it is... Yeah, um, one, one year delay was bad enough. Now it's just like, oof, yeah, two years, it's, it's a lot. But like, like you said, it is unfortunately part of being an indie filmmaker. It's, you know, you got to fight past those delays and eventually yeah. do what you want to do yeah we don't have a choice do we no no we don't no and um, going back to my indie productions uh you recently found yourself with some problems with facebook because uh, you know they've got all their stupid rules and stuff 
um, was how much. Well, it, it wasn't so much um, Facebook. It was basically um, apparently. I, I don't even know exactly, you know, today what happened. But it was sort of, um, I guess, hinted to me that um, it was um, somebody who basically complained to Facebook about me. Um, and, you know, continuously um, put in complaints, all bogus. Um, and Facebook generally just don't check. Um, they ended up just um, removing my account. And when I appealed several times and supplied all the details that they wanted, they never even responded. So my account was just taken off. Um, but that was just my personal account. Apparently, they can't do that to business accounts unless, you know, the business is... I don't know, snuff films or something. Um, <laughs> so my indie is still alive and well on, on Facebook, um, as are pretty much all of our um, film projects and everything. Um, it was just basically a hater situation where as my indie was growing, I guess, um, you know, more, more people could, could sort of see that. And it may have been someone, because my indie is also a curated um, community. So people send us their work. If we think the work is good enough, we build artist pages for them and promote their work. If we think their work is not quite up to snuff, um, we um, basically let them know. We tell them, look, it's, it's, you're just not there yet. Um, it's, it's great, keep doing what you're doing and get back to us you know, at a later stage. I guess some people take that badly, um, and also, in general, there's a lot of a lot of hate, you know, no, talking no. behind people's backs, gossip, all that going on in the indie community, and I think that kind of led to that. But you know, just like everything else, it's uh, maybe a little bit of an obstacle, but it's not going to stop us. So we keep going. They always say when those situations, you know, that what you're doing is working if it affects people in a negative way like that. Because it's it's just it's you see it all the time with a lot of, like you said in the indie film scene and it would be good if social media could be a little bit more uh, you know less aggressive in that sense with um, indie creators I, I don't know what, what would you feel that maybe social media could do more for like you know us being able to get uh, to be able to keep the business afloat in that respect. Well, well, a lot a lot of social media in that regard is Facebook. Um, Facebook has pretty much a monopoly on that type of social media. Mm. Um, and the thing with Facebook is it's all automated and, and algorithms. Um, they, they don't check up on anything. They don't really care. Um, they just want people to, you know, to use their paid ads and that's it. It's if, you're, if you're a business on Facebook, they try to push you, push you, push you. If you advertise too hard, they take you down. Um, so, you know, it's a free service up to a point. Um, and then, yeah, they just target you, um, all the, the, their algorithm does, I guess. Um, because of that, we've had to kind of scale down our, uh, you know, our promotions of other indie artists. We, we pretty much promote 95 plus percent of our promotions are for other artists, not ourselves, you know, people like you and, and, and a lot of others who don't belong to, to my indie productions, the production company. Um, but um, but they do it to the artist community. Um, so there was really never any any reason for Facebook to target us, but because it works on an algorithm, it does that. Um, in the same respect, Facebook should check up on people's complaints and stuff like that um, when you get reported for whatever. They just take it as as almost true and put mm -hmm. the um, the burden of, the burden of proof on you, the person who's been complained against rather than the, the person who made the complaint. So that makes it yeah, very tough to, to exist in that sort of environment. Um, one which of is the... why I'm, 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 al I'm almost happy that, that I don't have a, an account anymore because I don't have to deal with that side anymore. Now you've got someone else running the admin side of my indie productions. Yeah, I have, yeah, I have Peter Angel who's kind of helping out at the moment. I set up the promotions and sort of pass them on to him and he um, puts them up on, on Facebook. Um, but again, it should have never been that. And, uh, and Peter is generous with his time, but you know, that's also up to a point. One of the, um, one, so, yeah. 
<clears throat> one of the other VOD sites, well, you're involved with a VOD site, aren't you? Um, let me get this right. Anger Man Productions. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, it's not a VOD site as such. It's, a, it's actually a distribution company. Yes, um, I always get that wrong. Moment, Sorry. Yeah. M at the moment, most of um, our, our point of sale is through VOD. Um, we mainly use um, Vimeo, Vimeo On Demand. Um, yeah, we, uh, that's, that's Peter and I as, um, as partners. We set that company up many, many years ago uh, while we were running some small um, film festivals, indie film festivals in Australia. Um, again, you know, we always had that sort of indie spirit. We were trying to, to promote and help out indie artists. And at the time, we weren't really filmmakers. We haven't started yet. Um, but uh, working through the festivals, we saw a lot of amazing films that basically never got distributed. Um, it was, you know, short films were really made to, to just be put up on YouTube and, and pretty much slowly die. Um, even if they get a lot of views early on, you, you know, those would tend to kind of taper off until basically it was just sitting there. Um, so we tried um, as much as we could to, um, to help them, um, you know, to help distribute those films, to, to get them in front of people and, uh, and get some sales to, to try to get some revenue for these filmmakers so they can make a little bit of money back so that they can make their next short. Um, and that, that worked, again, up to a point because we were doing everything pretty much voluntarily and, uh, you know, time became an issue, um, more for Peter than for me, and uh, he had to pull out and I couldn't do it by myself. So basically we folded that. Um, and just sort of in, in recent years, with the success of my indie, um, we kind of brought up the idea of relaunching Younger Man and, uh, you know, using the, the my indie platform to, to help that. So we've done that, and, and so far it's, it's, it's going okay. It's just it's a very, very difficult, um, you know, field, I guess. Um, because, again, um, we're, we're doing shorts and features and series, but, um, yeah, it's very, very difficult to get people to pay to watch shorts. doesn't matter how little. Um, and, again, even if the, that pay is to go back to, you know, to, to the artists, you know, the large majority of the money goes back to the artists. Um, yeah, people don't seem to, you know, they say they support indie film, but their support only extends up to a certain point. And generally having to take out their wallets is not, you know, it's kind of past that point. So we're, we're trying to find ways, we're trying to keep pushing um, the films and, um, yeah, hopefully we'll get there eventually. Well, this is it, man. You've always got the drive and you've got the heart to like keep pushing it forwards. And I know like heart doesn't always, you know, pay bills for independent filmmakers and stuff. But in a, in a legacy oh, respect, yeah. there's, I feel like what, what you've done and what you've been doing is going to be remembered, if that makes sense. Um, I, I hope so, but it's not why I'm doing it. Um, you know, I'm not doing this for legacy. I'm, I'm basically doing it to, again, to help indie filmmakers now. Mm. Um, so if what we do helps people by, you know, connecting them um, with other distribution companies or, um, or helping them get some revenue through Angerman or helping them hook up with whomever for whatever through my indie, um, then, you know, we're getting some results, and I'm happy with that. But um, it was never about, you know, legacy or anything like that. I actually don't promote myself as much as um, as other people. I, I prefer to sort of stay, you know, in in, in the shadows in a way. Um, yeah, behind the scenes. I don't, I don't put. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't put my, my face up much, um, you know, on social media. Uh, I don't do many, you know, any actually Facebook lives or anything like that. It's just not my thing. Um, I've kind of tried to get into that a bit more for, you know, I've been told, you know, people will relate more and all that, but it's just, yeah, it's not, not really my thing. And my indie is probably over, over 90%, you know, 
me. So yeah, it's, sometimes it's difficult, um, you know, connecting with people. But we, we, you know, as 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 my India, we've we've done pretty well um, over time. It's it's hopefully it'll just keep growing. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. And um, my pleasure. Plug your websites. Plug all your links. Obviously, if you want to see um, your work, you can see that on my indie productions website. On top of your support for other artists. Yeah, yeah, we have. Uh, well, mindyproductions.com sort of encompasses all of that. The um, the artist pages on there. Um, the all. I mean, all the artist pages are there. Our projects are there. Everything that um, that we promote is there. Um, we do a lot of promotion through Facebook, so uh, Mindy Productions, we have a page and also Mindy Productions group, uh, basically, you know, uh, pulling the community together a bit more. Um, we are also on Twitter, Mindy Productions, my personal Twitter is, um, it's uh, at itiger32, um, basically on most platforms I use that. Um, we are also on Instagram. It's just that we don't really have much time for it lately, so oh, it's been a bit, uh, neglect, neglected, I think. Um, but yeah, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. Um, on on my indie, we on on the website, we do a lot of reviews. Um, another project that we didn't talk about was basically the mainly review vlog. Yes, with, um, yeah, let's talk about that quickly show. before. Yeah, with the with the South Angel um, hosting. Um, reviewing strictly indie films. We did a few of your projects on there, mm. which was um, a lot of fun. Um, we did two seasons of that. Um, at the moment, it's on a, on a break. But I don't know if we'll pick it up again. It depends on kind of what happens with this corona thing um, and if we can get back to, um, to recording and editing and all that in that way. It's just it's getting a bit, a bit harder. Um, there's, there's very there's very little uh, very little help so it's it's difficult you know um, when I was in Israel Asaf and I were in the same place so we were working on that together but now it's um, everybody's kind of working more on their um, on their area of things so I don't know if we'll, if we'll get back to that show but we've got about uh, 70 odd episodes um, and it's all on the website for people to enjoy we'll keep promoting it as well so yeah it's done pretty well yeah as if so um, we're, we're, we're all over so, um, yeah, if you look for us, you'll find us. Yeah, you can, like, yeah, check them out on all those links. We'll put the links down below in the information. And, yeah, definitely check out my indie reviews. They're, they're, he's incredibly entertaining and puts a hell of a lot of detail and thought into the films. So, yeah, definitely mm -hmm. check it out. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming on our little podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. No worries, man. You have a good day. You too, mate. Bye bye. So moving on, guys. Uh, like I said before, we we've decided to sort of focus on the horror genre uh, at least once a month and kind of uh, detail different aspects of horror, whether it be supernatural, whether it be serial killers, and serial killers being the one we're going to look at today. Um, a reason in behind this is we tend to do a lot of horror films anyway, and um, so we thought we kind of explore in that a little bit more and kind of give you guys a bit more of an understanding as to our creative processes um, and what we look for within horror and um, what actually makes a good horror film in general. So without further ado, guys, serial killers. Well, we've been talking about this um, like throughout the week of like where did you know, serial killers come from in for cinema sense. And uh, the first serial killer film is not Psycho, which I mean, like, most horror fans know that, but generally people think Psycho is the first serial killer, like, f film in that respect. But really, it's uh, Peeping Tom by Michael Powell, which I, which I know um, you, we've seen that yeah. film. Yeah. I, I, really, I really enjoyed that film, as, as far as I remember. It was years ago that we yeah, watched it, yeah, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, but it was really, uh, I remember it being quite haunting in a way. Um, well, it, yeah, because it was, it was a British film and it was just very slow and he used to kill him with the end of the tripods. Mm. And a lot of it, from what I remember, is from his POV. Because you see I think the it's leg from of his, the, the, his camera. From the lens, lens yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like, uh, almost found footage as well. Yeah, in some respects, it was it mixed a lot of different things, and Michael Powell was um, part of like this 
elite privilege, not privilege, the elite esteem kind of directing duo, Powell and Pressburger. And Powell and Pressburger did films in the 40s and the 30s. They did uh, The Red Shoes, which is a stunning film. Um, the Life and Death of Colonel Blimp, um, Black Nastus. But essentially, when he decided to go off on his own accords, the first film he wanted to make was Peeping Tom. And it was universally hated when it first came out. The Daily Mail and uh, I believe, um, well, whatever the other equivalent of Daily Mail would have been back then, probably The Express. I don't think The Express existed then. One of those newspapers. <laughs> they essentially attacked and um, made the director feel like he did something wrong. His career was over. He literally could not get work after making that film. And it was only after many years that Scorsese like, rediscovered the film, people watched it. But the reason why it's interesting is this was only perhaps within a year's distance of when Psycho came out. And Psycho obviously got the complete opposite response. It was absolutely adored. And yeah, I think maybe because it's an American film, more so than the British were still very, we're talking 59 in Britain. Mm. You know, being as reserved as possible and repressed as possible was the British way completely. Mm. There is no room for anything else. And you could say the same thing about America, but what, what Psycho does so well is that he's supposed to be that nice guy because he's Norman Bates. He's all kind, he's all well-mannered and he's there to look after you, but he's actually the Psycho. Whereas if I remember in Peeping Tom, he's already artistically um, inclined. Mm -hmm. So that to people was too like, not alien, but too kind of, too strange. I think, I think also there's something about uh, watching from a camera where you can see the leg of the tripod sticking out and that is the well, it's weapon perverse. that's being used. It's a perversity. It's, yeah, it's very much in the like like the descript the title itself, the names mm. on the tin, the peeping tom, you know. It does make you feel like you're watching something that you shouldn't be watching. That's the thing, um, psycho is almost immediately scandalized by mm. being psycho. Yeah. You know, the title alone gives you an idea of what you're walking into. Taking your point, you said that it's shot through the camera, isn't it, Peep and Tom? Mm. Um, and that's what you kind of see. <clears throat> um, so with that, it's almost like the viewers of viewer would become the killer. Maybe yeah. people couldn't empathise with that. Whereas if you take Psycho, for example, Psycho, um, it's a nice fella, it's a mm. nice guy. You can get on board with him. And then he flips, so it's kind of, you've always got that fourth wall. But it's it's funny though, because the scene that is most remembered in that film um, is practically a POV shot of the knife coming yeah, the, down. You know, the, that, the that stabbing. The, you know. But there's still a fourth wall, isn't there? Oh yeah, yeah, and the majority of the film there is that fourth wall. But like that, that sort of is a moment that kind of breaks it. And it's the most remembered part. But it seems that in, in but, too much of a high dose, in it's, essence, it's too that, much for people. So basically then, if you're saying that it's the most remembered one, it's because people obviously remember it as if it was, it was shocking. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. It's, it, so that then reinforces the, the, yeah, yeah. maybe the reason they didn't like Peep and Tom at the time. One of the other things with um, Psycho, and the same with, uh, although they're not serial killers, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, is that these films were influenced by the crimes of a serial killer in the 50s called Ed Gein or Ed Gein, depending on how you want to pronounce his name. And he was like this, well, crazy dude, who essentially uh, murdered women and used their skin to make um, lamps and other oh, things around the house. That, I see, yeah. I, yeah. I've, I, I, forgot, I always forget that person's name. Yeah, and <laughs> he was obsessed with his mother and... A bit like Norman Bates in response to the, he was just someone that everyone thought was a nice guy. And they didn't know the darkness behind. And I think that's what really got to the audience with Psycho. And I think that's where people continue to follow with, when they pick up on certain things that real serial killers have done. Is it's playing with at least some reality. Whereas something like Peeping Tom, <clears throat> at least at the time, it was a fabricated character. It makes it a little bit harder, if that makes sense. Mm. Because people like to be scared, and they like to be scared even more when they have some idea this could be based on some sort of truth. Yeah. Which is, again, a strange notion that people get more disconnected from fantasy in that respect when it comes to serial killers. So do you think, then, like, if you take going into the 70s and the 80s specifically, horror started to have a bit more of a boom, um, arguably, that coincided with the terminology of serial killer. So more and more cases, more and more um, 
serial killers were being caught, convicted. You were hearing more stories. I think I, th I think there was also like this media fascination, and I'm not sure what came first, whether it was the media fascination or the or the film with with the serial killer. So people were hearing just a lot more stories about these these things happening. Um, I, I don't know if it was necessarily happening more or, or not. It was just that it became the zeitgeist thing that people like to get panicked about. I think it's that funny time as well where like if you think of when the majority of like real life serial killers, particularly in America, because we are talking about America here, mm -hmm. it's late 70s and obviously culturally things were changing in a heavy way and if you look at the cinematic comparison, although we'll talk about more in depth because it's a whole genre in itself, slasher films. Mm -hmm. Slasher films are to some degree serial killer films but usually spend more time with the victim. That's to me the major difference between a serial killer film and a slasher film, you don't spend too much time with the psychology of a slasher killer. Mm. Yeah, and also, I suppose to back that point up, is that whenever some of these films were coming out, they probably weren't labelled as serial killer films until it was hindsight. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, they, that's, that's the, yeah, which is completely driven by the capitalist interest in making franchises. Franchise birthed serial killers in those particular horror films. Jason is only a serial killer from part two. He's not even in part one, you know? <laughs> or even uh, Michael Myers, like, in the first film, he's just someone out for revenge in a killing spree. But you, Okay, so with Michael Myers, you could argue that because of past trauma or trauma as, uh, that he experienced as a child and everything, um, which then he reacted badly to, <clears throat> that then motivates him in the same way as, like, real-life serial killers have. That then their vengeance quest is oh I need to go and punish the person that wronged you me. You see that's that's the, that's the difference is that what what Michael Myers does in in the first Halloween is a killing spree, yeah. which is also something that people do, but it's not serial killing is is going and specifically go, like going out to kill in in a much more well it's it's not like one a one event where they're going around killing over and over they kill a person. They move on, they kill another person, kind of thing. It's That'll much be a more repetition planned out. As well. Yeah, but that's so, what I'm saying. Yeah. But it, it's derived from um, past trauma. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you'll you, always find with these the, films there's some level of past trauma to to make sense of the, the violence because otherwise it feels, um, I don't know, cheap. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, and especially when we go into the 80s, we go into that cheapness of them making as many as possible. Mm. But if you compare Halloween to the film Maniac, which came out in the 81 or 82, I can't remember. But essentially, Maniac is a slasher film. But again, it's from the serial killer's perspective. And it's, it still explores a lot more psychology, closer to Halloween. Because you're right, the one thing that Halloween does that makes it kind of closer towards serial killer film than a slasher is you do have more of a psychological understanding of the killer from the start. Yeah. Whereas you think of a lot of slasher films in the 80s in particular, when they revealed why the killer done, did it, or even Scream, they usually would explain it in a psychological reasoning as to why they're so messed up. Yeah, at the end. From the beginning, yeah. You get it at the end. That's what makes Halloween unique in that kind of case, definitely. And Maniac very much plays with that, because Maniac is about a guy who essentially kills women and scalps them. And then puts them on mannequins, and um, like one of the mannequins, his mum, and it's and yeah, it's a very, it's a really great film, but it's very f fucked up. I think that's the key thing with serial killer films. There's the extra element of being totally fucked up, where it goes beyond just murder. There's a twistedness because there's so much of a extreme filia when it comes to serial killers. The very desire and needs of what they're doing. Can I pose a question to both of you? So. What for? No, just thinking. So, what do you guys think is the best way to make a serial killer film? Because we've obviously had this sort of slashery style where they might have motive, they might go out and they do, do like you say, Jack, they kill in one area, like one person that matches their criteria of the type of person they want to kill, whatever, then they move on. Or do you do it like in the style of the Ted Bundy film, or Zac Efron, where it's just a, a complete focus on him and he's always denying it to everyone until I think there's another way that you can, you can go with the, with serial killer films and that's uh, down the thriller route 
um, where the detective is focused on. And that's something that came in later, isn't it? After yeah, yeah, basically from the like the nineties when you've got uh, Science of the Lambs, Seven. Yeah, there was just like an onslaught of serial killer focused on detective films. And I think um, a lot of that's to do with. The more public understanding of what serial killer was, as the FBI was starting to have a bit more understanding of it. Mm. So you go the thriller route. Right? I don't know if I, that's how I would make it. I just think that there's um, there's there's interesting there's there's different interesting elements to serial killer uh, films about serial killers where you can take it down these different genre routes, and it depends on what the uh, the focus is on what what you want to do with the story, whether you want it to be. Um, about that serial killer, like you, because because uh, you know you could learn a lot more about that serial killer through the investigative process and uh, uh, learn about their psychology through that, um, or you can have a character focused piece where you're focusing on a on a, an individual character and you're seeing uh, their internal uh, you know going ons, you know <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, I. Uh, <sighs> It I just depends know. on I the know. outcome. I think it depends on the story that you're trying to tell, yeah. doesn't it? I think that the differentiation between what you just said there is like with the thriller and the horror. Hmm. The horror is more likely to put you in the victim's place or it'll put you with the killer so you can be yeah. horrified by their actions. A detective is the one putting the pieces of the puzzle together. So you, you can, you, you're sort of staying away from the horror. You're just seeing you know, the body afterwards or you're getting a quick image of it but you're focusing more on them Getting to hopefully the you know happy ending of the killer being caught, or if anyone's seen Seven, seen not, seven. not a seven. happy ending whatsoever. It's a crazy film. <clears throat> For me personally, when it comes to these sort of films, it's all about psychological character studies. That's why I love serial killer films. That's why I love writing serial killer films, because you have a character that you're essentially you, you're seeing him on a trajectory of a downward spiral, but they will have a violent response to it. And to me, there's, you can spend a lot of time thinking about the different types of serial killers, and sure, that's what psychology's for. But um, yeah, there's, there's the outsider serial killer, the one who's angry with society and has a violent response to blame for it. Or you have the, the planned serial killer, the serial killer that plans every point, and there might be some crazy bigger reason as to why they think it, you know, the, big, the, the grand plan, the master idea, as it were. So when like doing those sort of films, it's nice to be able to explore different sort of people through it, you know? Like, if we were to talk about the kind of films we've done personally, two serial killer films we've shot in the last two years was Millennial Killer and Decline. Now, Millennial Killer is very much part of the, f the second one of the plan. He has some crazy plan he wants to, see to get Naomi, his victim, to watch. as so he slowly kills all the Millennials because media has made him think that Millennials are really bad and that's the only way we can deal with the problem. Whereas Decline was the outsider. It was a guy who could not recognize his own n negative ways. And, you know, psychological abuse he'd given to his partner that he had a violent outcome from it. So I suppose like... Denial. In, yeah, it's denial. And, and for you as an actor, when doing Decline, what... Made what? What did you do when trying against that mind of a of a serial killer? Because if it's all psychologically driven, I'm I'm basically spinning your question on you now. <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot. It's kind of uh, my process of it is to try and block out stuff. So <clears throat> when you're talking to a character and they have their own motives, or there's one scene in particular with Omar, and. Um, Omar's talking about his job and like how great it is and stuff. My character, Ian, doesn't have a job, um, but he doesn't have any motivation to get a job. But rather than look at and self-reflect on himself, he's like, no, nah, blame everyone else. So you just go with that kind of mindset and that process. It's his fault. He's taking the job. That's why I can't get a job. And you, you kind of then have a string of different things and excuses that you plant within your own head that then gives that character motive. And that's kind of how I reacted to it. It's if anyone ever had an answer for the character, how would the character respond? No, he, it's not him, it's it them. Well, this is it. Like, one of the things they always say about serial killers, and there is no full-on scientific proof, but it's an idea, is lack of empathy that a serial killer has. So they have no empathy or, or no sympathy or no understanding towards their victims. And I think that's one of the things that um, cinema gets to explore a bit more with. Because no one wants to think about that in reality, 
But when you have a serial killer that has like, you know, you're like, oh my God, they killed them as well. And they killed that person. And yeah, there might be the motivation for their crazy reasoning of it. Or like we said, the outsider of just doing it because it's the only response rather than relating or connecting in any way, you know? Yeah, I think as well, the serial killer sometimes has his limitations. So if you see with Decline, like he's never actually going after anyone that's done him wrong. He goes after innocence or vulnerable. Probably yeah. vulnerable is a better word for it. The ones that he knows he can get over on. Um, which is interesting because that's, again, a different way of, like, the way a serial killer would have their motives. Well, again, it is the classic attribute. Um, those real serial killers, they did go for vulnerable people. Yeah. And again, pretty much nearly every 80s slasher kind of film, they're going after the vulnerable in the, in the sense of young people. Or, which is, which is where it gets a bit ugly with serial killer films, they go after women. And for a long time, that there is a certain amount of sleaze image when it comes to serial killer films, especially in the 80s. Because there was a lot of them that were more just exploitive of how far a killer would, would twistedly kill women. Who will strip down and he'll do this and you'll see as much exploitive imagery as possible towards the women, as well as the violence. And there's a, a weird line with that because yes, there are, most killers are centered around those kind of things. But when there was just a, a wave of constant cinema going that way, which wasn't interested in performance or anything like that, it was more interested in exploitation and kind of cheap exploitation. There is there is that line, isn't there, where you you're looking at how vulnerability can affect people, particularly like you know you say, oh, there's this serial killer and he goes and kills homeless people like we like we have in decline. Um, those people are. We didn't kill real homeless people. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just to those, clarify, those people are obviously um, are less likely to have uh, someone who, uh, that's going to be able to inform that they've gone missing, or, or someone that is going to be taken seriously if they walk into a police station um, and and report something like this. Um, you you're going to have less evidence, less sort of, less everything to be able to backlash. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that it, it, it's interesting because you can explore those ideas of vulnerability and how that affects people differently to other people. But then you can also use that to exploit it and to, you know, play into that masculinity, lad culture kind of... Uh, I mean, obviously it wasn't called lad culture back in the 80s, but you know what I mean. There is a twisted kink towards that. You see a lot in, like, in the independent film scene in extreme cinema. Because one of the things you're guaranteed to get in either extreme cinema or, or horror in general, especially with zero budget, is serial killer films. They are the cheapest, easiest films to make. Like, it's just someone and a body count. And you see it, like, uh, like non-stop. And people, people want their own franchises, which makes sense. And some of them veer into being a slasher and some of them don't. But it is a very, very, almost, well, it, well, it is primitive. It's primitive in the sense of it's one of the first things we do as a human action. So it makes sense why there's always going to be films about violence and about people killing in the serial killer sense. So I get why there's always the drive towards it. I just wish people would remember the psychology as to why they're at that not point. Not just do it for the sick of doing it. Not just for the gore. I mean, I, yeah, I yeah. respect a good gore scene. But yeah. there are some scenes where, especially in smaller independent films, where it's just really bad gore scenes. Yeah. And it just, you're just like... Spend more time getting to know who this killer is. Well, that's the thing. A gore scene to me is is the same as an action scene, or the same as like even a magic trick or something like that. It is about the presentation around it that makes it makes it meaningful. So if you don't have those sort of like um, narrative structures, if you haven't sort of analysed the the positions of vulnerability and thought about that that on a on a deeper level, then uh, you know it's it, the gore isn't going to pay off because. The gore needs that, that deeper level to make it good. It's the same with how um, people portray victims. If you have a 2D victim who's just going to like be there for a second, maybe scream and then her top's off and she's killed, it doesn't matter. Like It becomes irrelevant because you're just like, well, that was just a kill. There's no connection. Yeah, I don't really understand why that killer did that. Oh, he likes women. What a shocker. Most killers like women. There are so many... You can, you can develop such interesting characters in serial killers. And... I personally think for an actor, you can show a hell of a lot of range playing a serial killer. Because again, it's very different from a slasher killer where there's a mask and it's all about physicality. You have to convey that psychology of how someone could be 
that broken that their only answer is to kill. I was going to ask you, um, would you class Saw as a serial killer film? Well, Saw is... Because um, it's kind of, I don't know, it's on the it's cusp. Gore, it's gore porn, but you're right, it is a serial killer film as well. You could easily put that, like, it has the same setup as Seven. Mm. But it's just more based around the games that they're playing as opposed to, you know... But there's motives behind every single one because yeah. they wronged him in some sort of well, some sort of situation in his life. Yeah, but is that then not personal rather than uh, serial killing? Like, is that... Is serial that... killing can be personal. Well, okay. Because if, everyone, if all the victims look like their mum, for example... Or if all their victims looked like an abusive boss. Yeah, but that to me still, still isn't isn't personal. That's not an act of revenge. That's an that's an act of yeah. But uh, if it's an act of revenge, more desecrating an image if it's still, in your own mind, isn't it? Yeah, right? but if it's still a number of people and it's got like particular motive behind it, then... think of the Unabomber. Yeah. In response to the Unabomber, that he was a serial killer. I'm not sure. I call him. I think I'd call him. He killed people. Yeah, he definitely killed civilized. people. I'm not saying he didn't kill people. <laughs> I'm saying, I'm saying took him a while. that I don't know if you would, uh, if if you'd call it, if you'd call it serial killing in that in that sense. But he I, had the same motive, the the same reasoning as to doing it. It was very planned, and meticulous planning is very much part of being a serial killer. Yeah, but then where's the line between that and terrorism? Because I feel like that's much more. It is a tricky one with terrorism. I think yeah, yeah, that would be because it's bombs. So you're looking at taking out people on multiple, like it's 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 aimed to cause terror, isn't it? Whereas yeah, a serial absolutely. Killer doesn't aim to cause terror. That well, they might. Do, well, they but do. They, they aim more directly to appease themselves, as as far as I'm aware from from. I kind of feel like um, Ryan's right that you could put Saw in the serial killer category, especially if you consider the 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 one that's been rescheduled, um, Spiral. Yeah. Yeah. That is from the detectives looking at, well, basically it's seven. It just looks like seven with Saw on top of it. So I think Saw can be seen as a serial killer. It's just that film is more interested in the torture, the games, mm. the violence. Hence why that, that whole terminology of gore, gore porn. Was it gore porn? Torture porn, not gore porn. <laughs> yeah, I think you just created a whole different genre. Nah, that's probably out there. That's definitely out there Gore porn with Sam it, it, next it, week. <laughs> it is interesting how this is how these have changed over time because when you think of that sort of the initial um, serial killer films, what you know, the like like Peeping Tom and, and Psycho is very much um, you're you're looking at that these deeply disturbed individuals. I know they're disturbed later on, but it's much more sort of focused on that on unsettling you, making you feel uncomfortable. Whereas as it, as it moves on and changes, um, because of the sort of uh, thinking behind why people were serial killers and things like that, developing and changing, um, it, it has it has developed into something entirely different. So it's interesting that you'd say Saw is a serial killer film, because like obviously that came out of um, uh, after 9-11, when they're, when they're, you know, the... the uh, Guantanamo, all the stuff about Guantanamo Bay started coming yeah. out and stuff like that. You know where we saw um, American soldiers and, and American uh, officials actually torturing um, sit American citizens. But they always say with hostile, hostile is like a, a direct relation to mm. that situation. Yeah, um, and that's and that's I think that's the interesting thing about the way these serial killer films uh, films have changed and the way that we think about. Uh, elements of society and we and we put those onto the killer and uh, sort of look at again it comes down to that uh, that sort of analysis of vulnerability doesn't it where where you're looking at, at who's vulnerable at a certain time and how they're being made vulnerable by this uh, powerful figure that that somehow is deciding their fate deciding their destiny see um, one film that particularly does that probably better than personally like I think it's the best serial killer film. It's American Psycho. American Psycho is directly about all those elements. It pretty much has like all the sides you can think about within a serial killer. And one of the great reasons why that works so well is because if you've read the book, the book is vile. I love the book, it's a brilliant book, but it is a vile book because it's completely from his perspective. There is no sense of humor to it. Whereas the director who took the book realized the book was incredibly misogynistic and being a female director, uh, Mary Harron, 
she, along with the writer, took it from, well, let's, let's make a dark comedy out of this. Let's play on the misogyny of it. Let's play on who this person is. And I think that's why it works so well as a serial killer film, because you, he's a very boring human being to the point that he imagines killing people. Because he doesn't kill anyone. There is, I mean, there's the, the ambiguous of the ending, but in reality, he hasn't killed anyone. His position of power, where he can have it over others, he can fantasize about being a killer, but in reality, he has a very, he's got a dull existence because he has everything he needs. Mm. He almost doesn't need to be a serial killer. I think, um, once again, like we've discussed in, like, with the other films, it gives an actor a hell of a lot of room to, you know, like, Christian Bale's amazing as Patrick Bateman. It's one of the most iconic characters ever created. Yeah, I, I just, whenever you, anyone talks about the movie, I just think of the the scene where he puts the, um, the, the like, the Kugel map mac type thing on uh, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and like bludgeon is it he bludgeons them is that in his yeah. is that in his yeah. flat yeah yeah, yeah and he it's puts the music on yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lewis. yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> that's yeah. the thing there's, I love that scene <laughs> <laughs> there's just... an air of calmness to it and everything and just po poise and purpose mm. like when you're strutting around if you think of that peak point as well that like the 80s was a very much peak point when serial killers at least on an American understanding were very much on the zeitgeist they were, they were they were happening quite frequently still, you know? There was a lot going on. Well, that's uh, when the whole terminology of serial killer came about. Yeah, yeah. And American Psycho, as the book, came out in 1990. So they, they almost created their, like, celebrity serial killer from the 80s lifestyle, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And, I, yeah, that's why I think it succeeds best as, in, as a serial killer film. So, guys, yeah, thank you for um, taking the time to listen to our podcast. As ever, please give us a like, um, a comment if you've got a film that you want us to review, and also give us a, a little subscribe. Um, join us again next week, and other than that, Trash Arts Take Out! Bye! Bye.